Ladies and gentlemen, good evening to you and welcome to this month's Wellington Trust Heritage Lecture. For those who managed to make it, you're very welcome uh, and it's going to be good to see you and hopefully hear you later on. And thank you very much indeed for coming on board. Before I introduce our speaker tonight, I can say that we're in for a real treat. Um, and part of that treat will mean you fastening your seatbelts as well at certain stages during um, Kevin Maynard's uh, lecture. It's really quite exciting. Um, this is the story of the RNLI on the River Thames. But before I go into more detail and tell you more about this speaker, may I please just have the next slide because I have a little bit of housekeeping to be done. Right, as is the case uh, every month, um, what I'm glad to say is that this month we have actually hopefully done some improvements on our webinar system. So hopefully we'll be not quite so fraught with some of the problems that we've experienced, most of which are in the Zoom lectionary where we managed to find them all over the, over the months. This time uh, you will be very welcome to, uh, to, make, to ask questions. Um, and in previously you'll notice at the bottom of your screen there is a chat but there's also a Q&A box. Um, and if you would like, if you can find it, to use the Q&A box for sending questions, um, just put it up, send it to everyone. And Jenny Mosley, who is on here, will collect those together and hopefully will then be able to deliver your questions. Now, at the end of the lecture, if you want to stay on and chat, um, we are able to do so, but it's a slightly more hydraulic way of doing this. Rather than just saying, all turn on, your video and your audio. Uh, what I will say is that we're going to bring you in. We, in fact, bring you in um, by pressing buttons against your name on the screen. It's all a bit technical. So it will take a, a little while, not too long, um, but you might look as if, or it might appear as if we've been knocked out of the lecture when you do that, if you want to come in. But in fact, you would be brought straight back in again. So. Um, Matt Edgar, who is our technical guru in the background, will be going down your names and will, he'll be inviting you in. Of course, if you want to leave at that stage, just simply close out of the lecture. So hopefully that will work. Also at that stage, you will be able to turn on your video yourself, turn on your audio yourself, and then we can have the usual chat afterwards. And if Kevin is happy to do so, and hasn't been called away, and I will mention that in a minute, um, he may take another question or two, who knows, that will be great. Uh, once again, at the, uh, after the lecture, there will be a recording, and we will be sending you a link to that recording. Now, if I may have the next slide, please, um, Kevin. Let me, with great pleasure, introduce Kevin May Maynard, who is the station manager of the uh, Royal National Lifeboat Institution's Tower Station, which is situated just about a cable, or for the uninitiated, and there are not many of those, about a couple of hundred yards up from the good ship Wellington on the Thames. I happen to know it's one of the busiest um, stations in the whole of the fleet, um, but Kevin will talk more about that. Now to Kevin himself. Kevin, I think, was probably born with water sloshing around his, his pram. Um, he has been uh, connected with the river uh, for a good part of his life. Um, his father owned a passenger boat business which ran out of Westminster Pier. And uh, so he was very much involved in that in a young age, obviously. Um, and then at a, he applied for a job uh, having been on the river uh, actively as a waterman and sometimes lighterman for many years. He applied for a job at the RNLI back in 2001 when they were looking to start a dedicated station on the River Thames. This is the one of which he is now the station manager. Uh, he joined in 2002 as a mechanic. Uh, he became a helmsman in 2005. And then much later on and very recently, the last couple of years, I think indeed, uh, there's been a reorganization whereby he seems to be doing everything not only the station manager, but he is also now one of what they called the uh, Thames commanders. And basically he is in charge of a watch at any time. And I think Kevin will explain that a little bit more. 
Uh, it is a fact, and you will see that he's sitting in his office on uh, at the tower station. Um, and I just got to explain something I won't get to explain in most lectures beforehand. And that is if they have what they traditionally call in the RNLI a shout, i.e. needing help, uh, there are the people who will be going out, I think. But if the worst comes to the worst, and it's a bad one, we may be closing down the lecture early while he goes back into action. Um, I think that he can explain more of that, but obviously if there are any questions, you can put those in afterwards. I'm very grateful for Kevin taking time out to do this, um, being on watch uh, uh, tonight and giving a lecture at the same time is, uh, is a terrific call on his part. So now with great pleasure, if I may, Kevin, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Alistair. Um, I was gonna put my camera on, but I'm unable to seem to do that at the moment for some reason. Um, right, uh, is that one you can help with, you reckon, Matt? Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, I just, I'll, I'm on the shared screen now. It doesn't come up, the controls for the... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, let's have a look again. Kevin, I think you're doing things in the background, aren't you? Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Um, Matt, you're doing things in the background. Nope. Right, hang on. I've got it. You've got it. Well done. Oh, perhaps I haven't. No. Nope. Okay. All right. Well, it, it means that people don't get to see me as I'm doing it. But um, we'll see if we can stop along the way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Alistair. Uh, as uh, as you just explained, my name is Kevin Maynard. I'm the station manager at Tower Life Base Station. Um, as Alistair said, I'm, I worked on the Thames. I'm a freeman of the the company Walton Lightman. I joined the RLI in November 2001. Um, so the presentation that I'm going to deliver tonight um, is a brief history of the RNLI on the River Thames and how we come to be here, some of the things that we do. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer some questions at the end, but I, I am on shift. So originally I was going to do this, I, I would have been on shift today and I was going to do it afterwards, but uh, I've had someone go off sick for non-COVID reasons, thankfully, um, which means I'm now covering the night shifts on the boat. So. Uh, I officially start at seven o'clock and I will be on shift till seven in the morning. So there are some people around the station that will be able to cover for me if the bell goes now. Uh, but as Alistair said, if it's a, a particularly challenging job, uh, I may be called away. But hopefully I'll be able to get through this without that happening. Um, so the RNLI is the charity that saves lives at sea. Um, So the RNLI was founded in, in 1824. And not a lot of people know this, but the RNLI was actually founded in the city of London itself. Um, so Sir William Hillary, um, he used to live on the Isle of Man and he was seeing a lot of shipwreck around. So he approached the Admiralty with the idea of a, of a lifeboat service manned by volunteers that would go and rescue people, but they, they didn't seem to have a lot of appetite for that. So he came down to London and held a public meeting at the London Tavern. Uh, in the Bishopsgate area, which is now a branch of HSBC. Uh, and at that meeting, they founded the Institution for the Preservation of Life from Shipwreck. Um, so the first 20 years or so, the headquarters was at what is now Furniture Makers Hall in the city. Um, shortly after, a few years after they founded, they got uh, royal patronage and um, so they could use royal in the title. They moved their headquarters to Paul, which is where it is now and they became known as the, the Royal National Lifeboat Institution after a few other name changes over the years. Uh, and that's the name that we still use today. So originally, because of the time, it was men that went rode out in boats to try and save people that have uh, were in danger of ships sinking. And if we get through to the, the modern day, which uh, I'm, I'm having trouble with, I can't change the sides at the moment, Matt. Uh, back there. Um, so this is uh, the more modern face of the RNLI. 
um, beach lifeguards and, and boats. So the R and I they uh, design and build most boats in house. So they have um, workshops on the on the Isle of Wight at Cows. They have their own yard at the headquarters in Paul. Uh, it's about ten years from the original ideas, and they they start playing the lifeboats, and then they they're building themselves. And so they have different classes of lifeboats at different areas around the coast, depending on the surroundings and what they think they need. Um, Kevin, if, yeah. you, if you just click the screen, uh, you should be able to do it. There you go. It's it's working for you now. So just hit the next one. Right. So uh, around the coast, um, there's 237 lifeboat stations, and that is around the UK and also Ireland. The RNLA covers the Republic of Ireland as well. We're the, the only organisation uh, in the Republic of Ireland that has royal in the title. Um, and there are no issues. There are, are um, stations that are right on the border that um, have crew from either side and that they, they work fine. Um, so yeah, UK and all of Ireland. So there's 348 lifeboats on duty at any one time around the coast. Uh, we also have beach lifeguards on over 220 beaches. You would have seen in the press last year that there was a, a bit of controversy, mostly with the Daily Mail, uh, over the beach lifeguarding service. Um, that they felt that the, the RNI wasn't dynamic enough getting lifeguards trained up with the staycation boom and everything. We've, uh, we've done a lot more uh, preparation for it this year. I did think it, it maybe caught us a little bit unaware last year as it, it did uh, a lot of people no one really know what's happening but the beach lifeguards is uh, a service that's been rolled out for the last sort of 15 years or so uh, and has proved very popular um, and needed it's done slightly differently to how some of the lifeboats have done that it's a joint venture with local councils and they ask the rnli if they can provide uh, beach lifeguards and then the rnli pay the lifeguards wages but the uh, the councils pay for some of the training and equipment um, we also have a flood rescue team that they have people on standby at any time. So we've got um, centres around the country where all the equipment's stored. And then when there's uh, the floods, say like the floods you saw in Somerset um, in previous years, then the team will be on standby at any time and they'll respond to the page art and then uh, they will go to get the equipment and go to the site and they'll help out where needed. So the flood is uh, in the UK is. A lot of it is actually done by fire rescue services, um, but the RLI is just on hand should they need some extra pairs of hands. Um, so last year there was 8,462 launches around the, around the UK and Ireland, lifeboat launches, which is just over 23 a day. Uh, and 8,727 people were rescued on those launches, which is just under 24 a day. Uh, now, being a charity, we've got to be seen to be honest with the figures. So we go for, uh, we have people assisted, people rescued and lives saved, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, a bit later. So the annual running cost is £182.4 million pounds, uh, a year. So just over uh, well, half a million pounds a day. But that's all in, that's the cost of the buildings and, and uh, running all the boats and the building the boats. So the last few years, they've been replacing a lot of the fleet. Uh, they've got new modern boats that they've built. That are, uh, some of the boats that are sort of 15, 20 years old are being taken out of service. And they're, um, they're trying to put them uh, back in. Um, so this money, uh, £182 million pounds a year, the RNLI does not receive a single penny of government money. It is all on voluntary donations. Um, the most of it comes from legacies. There's uh, around 30% of it is for annual donations um, and also from investments um, that they already hold. And that's how the RNLI is funded. So the Thames Lifeboat Stations itself, uh, operations commenced on the 1st of January in 2002. Um, this was a result of the Marchioness disaster and subsequent inquiry. So if anyone doesn't know, in 1989, uh, a dredger called the Bow Bell hit a party boat called the Marchioness 
uh, by Canna Street Railway Bridge, and it resulted in uh, 51 people drowning in the Thames. So in the public inquiry, they found that various um, bodies of various authorities, so the Port London Authority, the police, the fire brigade, uh, and private craft all behaved very admirably on the night and they saved a lot of people, but there was no overall coordination and it hampered the, the, um, the rescue attempts. So the fire boat might search an area, but then the police would go and search the, the same area and it was felt that it wasn't the, uh, the best use of resources. So the inquiry suggested that a search and rescue service be set up on the Thames, like on the coast. So they asked the Coast Guard to do so. So Coast Guard approached the RNLI and asked them if they wanted to put lifeboats on the Thames uh, and then they would operate on the same way on the coast. So the, the Coast Guard and lifeboats around the coast, they work together, but they're, they're separate bodies. So the Coast Guard requests that a lifeboat launches and then the lifeboat crews feed back the information to the Coast Guard so they can plan the coordination of the search and rescue. Um, so the RNLI agreed that they would they would try it. They would put some lifeboats on the Thames, and it was the first time that they put lifeboats on an inland waterway, uh, rather around the, the the coast. So the the RNLI they set themselves a a target that they would have a lifeboat on scene to any incident within fifteen minutes of it occurring on the tidal Thames. So between. Uh, just below Gravesend up to Teddington. So to do this, they needed four lifeboat stations. So they put one at Gravesend uh, and they put one at Teddington. Um, so Gravesend and Teddington, they use boats that are already existed in the RNO fleet. So they use an Atlantic 85 at Gravesend and they've got a D-class boat at Teddington. And these are boats that you'll see on the coast as well. So for more central into London, they set up stations at Chiswick and at Tower. And they have a, a, a boat specifically designed for this, which is called the E-Class um, E class boat. And Chiswick and Tower are the only two boats, uh, sorry, only two stations on the Thames that use the, the E-Class boat. So uh, jet driven boats rather than propeller driven. Uh, and this is because the amount of debris and that in the Thames in central London, it means that there's less chance of damaging the props. It's also less chance of somebody getting injured if they're in the water with jets and there is propellers. But we can also put the boats on the ground without worrying about damaging the propellers. Um, so if we need to get onto the foreshore for access, uh, then, then we can do so. Uh, so these are the only boats in the RNLI that are not built by the RNLI itself. So the 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 boat you can see on the left is the one of the Mark Ones, um, which were the first ones. They was built by a company called Tiger Marine in Wales, and they built six of these. And these were the boats that we run with for the first eight years of the operations. And then uh, the boat you can see in front of Parliament is the Mark II, and this was built by a company called MST on the River Mersey. Um, there are three of these, which are uh, Echo Seven, Eight, and Nine. And um, uh, yes, and then we've got a, a new boat, which isn't here, but it's, it's recently arrived, that was built by Delta Marine, which is Echo 10, uh, which is used exclusively at Tower. So the E-Class Mark II lifeboat. Uh, so there, there's some of the stats. So it's, uh, they're 10 and a half meters long. There's a draft of just 0.7 of a meter. Um, so we've got two 435 brake horsepower Volvo Penta diesel engines in it. So the official maximum speed is 40 knots, but the boats actually do around 44 knots. Um, might get 45 out of them with the tide um, as well. So they're the fastest boat in the R and the Life fleet. Um, So yeah, the boats cost about 400 and the planned life is for uh, 15 to 25 years. Uh, now, Tower Life Base, when they set up the stations originally, um, Tower Life Base Station was based on Tower Pier. There's some offices down in the core and pontoon that belong to London River Services and the RLI rented um, one of them. So we was originally Tower Pier Lifeboat Station. Um, 
in 2005, the Metropolitan Police had a, an old station that you can see here that was based at Waterloo Bridge that they no longer needed. And so they sold it to the Armour of Life for a pound. And so we moved in 2006 to our present location by Waterloo Bridge. And that's the reason that we're Tower Lifeboat Station, despite the fact we're at Waterloo Bridge. Um, the pier that we're on at the moment, uh, which is where I am now, which is just along from the Wellington, uh, it was originally put in and it was used by the Royal Humane Society. Uh, and anybody that fell into the river for any reason, they was, uh, if they was rescued, they was taken back to the pier uh, where they was given some soup and some tea and maybe a bath. Uh, and then sent on their way. And then it was taken over by the police and it was a police station for many years. Uh, and there was a time where the end that you can see here, the inspector and his family would live on the pier and the other end was the operational police station. Uh, but it gradually fell into disrepair. The police are based down in Wapping with um, all their boats, uh, boats are there with the faster boats. There wasn't the need to have the, the the pier in central London anymore and it was falling into disrepair uh, which is why they they sold it on so the the, the pier was um, was towed away and a bit of work was done on the barge itself uh, and then the station was rebuilt as close to the original uh, as possible so this is what it looks like today uh, but the actual base of the pier is still bud, uh, pud lion it's the original um, original the one that went in about 160 years ago now so the, the station is no longer uh, economical to run the beer is so old and the amount of repair work that does it that has to be done on it also with the amount of wash that comes in and the, the jarring and the banging on the wall that we have uh, there's a project underway now to have a new station in place uh, in quarter two of next year um, so it's in the design stages at the moment. Um, but what it means with the new boat and the new station is that we are definitely here to stay. Um, so the, the, the new pier that they're planning is going to be the same length as the one you can see here, which is 50 metres, but it's going to be twice as wide and it's going to be off the wall a little bit, um, a little bit as well. So that's, that's, that's quite exciting. Unfortunately, I, I haven't got any plans that I can share with you of that at the moment because they've, they've not been... Um, They've not been drawn up properly. But the, every year since Tower Life Base Station has opened, it's been the busiest station in the R&I. Uh, last year, 2020, there was 404 launches. Now that's slightly down on our normal number. Um, with lockdown, there was no passenger boats or, uh, or party boats on the river, very few private craft, not a lot of people in London. The year before we did 627, the year before that was around 610. So uh, it, our calls have been gradually increasing every year, but we usually do sort of 550 to 600. Uh, so we're slightly down last year, but we're still the, the busiest station in the country by, by some way. Uh, so last year there was 18 lives saved um, and by the end of the year, that was 8,452 service launches since the station opened in 2002, with 336 lives saved. Um, I did mention earlier that we need to be, or as an organisation, we're careful with our figures. We don't want to be seen to try and over-egg what we do. Um, so the way that we do it, if... Um, if there's somebody in trouble or in difficulty in the water and the lifeboat rescues them, but there's also a police boat or another boat uh, nearby, then that's a, a person assisted because you would say that if the lifeboat hadn't rescued them, then one of the other boats that are in the area would have. Um, so the 336 lives saved are people that the lifeboat has rescued, that it was felt that if, um, if the lifeboat wasn't there, hello, <laughs> If the lifeboat wasn't there uh, on, on scene, then in most, uh, most likely that, that person would have drowned. Um, so at the moment, I'm sitting in the office and I can see our board for this year. So, so far in 2021, we've been called out 27 times and we've saved three lives. Um, all three of those have been in January. Um, so the, the, the way the stations work, uh, Teddington is like a, a traditional 
uh, lifeboat station where the crews carry pagers. Um, if they get a call, the pager goes, the crew goes down to the station and they, um, they launch the boat. Uh, Gravesend, Chiswick and Tower were set up uh, different ways. So I mentioned that the, um, uh, the Armand and Lass set themselves a target to have a, uh, a boat on scene to any incident occurring on the Thames and they have a boat on scene within 15 minutes. Um, they also want a second boat within 25 minutes if it's needed. Um, so the way that we do that is that we have crews on station all the time covering 12 hour shifts. So at Tower, it's the shifts are seven till seven. Um, so there's nine paid full-time Thames commanders and myself as station manager, I'm on the shift roster with them and we do four days on, four days off. It's not quite four days on, four days off, four nights on, four off. There's a bit of a pattern to it, but essentially it's four on, four off and you cover either days or nights. And uh, we have 55 volunteer crews and our volunteers, they commit to covering a minimum of two 12 hour shifts per month. And so the boat runs with, uh, in normal times, it runs with two full time and full two volunteer crew on. But at the moment, uh, what with lockdown and coronavirus, we're running the boat with two full time and one volunteer in sort of bubbles. So the volunteers are generally with the same full time people all the time. Uh, and we're just reducing the numbers um, from three, uh, four on the boat to three. Uh, it, it makes quite a bit of difference to the amount of contacts that people have coming on station. So it makes it easier to chase. It's just a way of we're trying to keep the service running as best as we can while complying with the rules and, and trying to make it easier for, for everyone. Um, so the reason that we're on station is that we cover from Barking, ordinarily we cover from Barking to Wandsworth or Barking to Battersea to Wandsworth from Tower. Um, at the moment, because there's some issues with Hammersmith Bridge, we're actually covering up to Putney unless there's a, a life at risk and then Chiswick can pass under the bridge, but no traffic can come under Hammersmith Bridge at the moment unless it's life at risk. So uh, for more routine things, we're covering up to Putney. But for us to get from central London all the way down to Barking um, in 15 minutes, we need to launch the boat in 90 seconds. So while we're on the station, we're half kitted up, ready to go. Uh, we have bells. The, the way that we're launched is the, the Coast Guard brings the emergency phone. At the start of each shift, the, the duty commander uh, specifies what each crew member are to do should we get a call. Um, and then, so if uh, the, the Coast Guard rings the phone, we have bells that ring throughout the station. So no matter where you are on the station, you can hear it. And then everybody knows what they've got to do. They'll start the boat up. The, the duty, duty commander asks the phone and finds out what the job is and where it is. Um, and then by the time they step on the boat, it should be singled up on the line with the engines going. The last line goes off. And then the rest of the information can be passed by the Coast Guard whilst the boat is on route. So it's all about getting the boat launched as quickly as possible in a safe way. Uh, and then the information can be passed as the boat's getting there. So by the time that you arrive on scene, you should have a full description and know exactly what you're going to. Um, but then this is, we're unique as a, an RLI lifeboat station of operating in this way, the, the Thames stations. It's not, it's not something that's done around the coast. Uh, right. Oh, that's gone. I need to go back. I didn't expect that to start playing straight away. Right. Uh, so I, uh, I'm going to show some videos. So on the Thames, we do all the jobs that you expect lifeboats around the coast to do, just in a, a greater volume, apart from um, windsurfers, windsurfers and jet skis. Hang on, excuse me. <coughs> uh, windsurfers and jet skis and um, we don't do paddle borders as well because they're not allowed on the tile Thames so we do um, uh, we, we do rescue obviously people in the water and these are some people are, that some people do fall in some people are out with friends and uh, are basically jumping for fun or showing off and swimming and get into difficulty uh, we do do people that are uh, 
are, are vulnerable and are suffering mental health crisis that are attempting suicide. Uh, we also go to uh, a lot of party boats, passenger boats for people that are ill or injured. Um, we have craft that are broken down. In the last few years, we've had a big increase of people getting cut off by the tide uh, that we go in and get them before they get into difficulty. Um, we was also um, about 12 years ago, we had a joint venture with London Ambulance Service and they approached Tower Lifeboat Station and said if they provided us with defibs and gave us the training, would we carry them on the boats? And we was the first lifeboat station to carry defib. But the reason is that uh, defib is effective um, if you can get it on somebody in about the first eight minutes of them suffering cardiac arrest. Uh, so for an ambulance, if somebody's on a boat in the middle of the river, for them to be able to get to the pier and the ambulance get to them and then the paramedics get on the boat to treat them in eight minutes, the chances are quite small. However, as just explained, we're here all the time and we can get out to people quite quickly. Um, so that's something now that the other stations do as well. Uh, but it, it's worked quite well. So I'm going to show some videos, um, which is going to be uh, cover someone. Now there is one in here that uh, shows a bit of CPR. You can't really see it, but you can see what's going on. So if anyone's going to be uncomfortable with that, I will warn you, it's, it's not graphic, it's not a close up or anything, but it is something that we do uh, not often compared to maybe ambulance crews, but we do it a lot compared to other lifeboats. Um, so it, it's about a third of all um, uh, medical jobs in the RNLI are carried out on the Thames. Um, so this is just a, a, a vessel that is broken down as drifting in, in central London. So it's the lifeboat goes alongside, gets in a tow and takes it into St. Catherine's dock to, to safety. And uh, this is a, a house barge that had come out of the Grand Union Canal and got caught out by the tide and got swept onto a barge and couldn't get off. So it's just pulling it out into the river um, to safety. I'm sure if some of you would be aware that the the, the tide in London is, is quite strong. So you can get sort of four or five knots of tide on a, a real big uh, spring tide. So the, the tide in central London um, on the, the biggest springs is about a 7.7 .7 metre rise. So this is uh, by Millennium Footbridge. That's Blackfriars Railway Bridge in the background there. Uh, and this was called to a, a vessel in trouble. And as you can see, there's a, a four people out on a sunny afternoon, not a life jacket between them. Um, I won't soup with this because you can see what's going to happen yourself. Uh, these are some children. This is by Tower Bridge that they've walked along the foreshore. They've gone down some steps and walked along the foreshore uh, and the tide's coming in and they can't get back off the, off the shore. That's me driving the boat on this one.
so where they were, um, probably they had about another 15 to 20 minutes before that little bit of beach that was on show would have been completely covered by water. Uh, so this was a, a woman, if you look by the buttress of the bridge, this is at Charing Cross Railway Bridge and the footbridges, and it was a woman on a night out with friends that tried, decided that she was going to try and climb to the railway bit. And this was at about uh, half past one on a February morning. Uh, very, very, very cold. And she so she got stuck um, on the stanchion between the bridge and the footbridge, um, and so was was clinging on, but she couldn't couldn't go back and and couldn't move forward, uh, and so basically she managed to stay there, and they were trying to get some help to her, and she couldn't hold on any longer and, and fell, but uh, luckily she was relatively okay. Uh, so this is a person that has jumped off of London Bridge and you'll see a very, this is how hard it is to spot. You, you might not have seen that because it is, but it basically it, it's just a face and, and some toes out the water and then that's it. And that's all the crew could see. So this is uh, just along the embankment from the Wellington as well. Uh, it's, so it's someone trapped. Um, down in the little inlet that, that nobody could reach. So they're, they're trying to throw something to them so they can hold on it and they, they drag them back to the boat. And this is, uh, this is Blackfriars Bridge again. Uh, that archway there is where the River Fleet comes into the, the Thames. And it's somebody who, who they don't know how he ended up, but someone a boat, passing boat spotted what they thought was a person up against the wall. So this is somebody, this is a, who's collapsed on a, a passenger boat that's heading into London with a suspected heart attack. Uh, so this is exactly what I'm talking earlier. So we, uh, we asked the boat, don't bother slowing down. You try and get into central line as quickly as possible. So we can pace with the boat and then come alongside so our crew can go on board. And so they're carrying a, a a defib and a oxygen resuscitation kit, so a bottle of oxygen. Um, yeah. Yeah, so this is uh, by the HMS Belfast, and this is some, someone who was sitting on the embankment wall and fell backwards. 
So they've landed on the foreshore. So you can see the height that they've fallen from. But this video is in, in segments because it's also the tide is coming in. So it, the crew have to work to uh, immobilize the person as much as possible uh, and prevent any further injury, but also keeping in mind that it's all going to be flooded very soon. So they're working with, there's a, uh, there is someone from London Ambulance Service there, but uh, we work quite closely with the police. And there's no way of getting them back up onto the foreshore. So the only way is bringing them onto the lifeboat. Uh, so this was the job. This is uh, this is outside uh, the National Theatre, and there is somebody in the water, and a jogger running past has jumped in and tried to save them. You can see there's two people over the wall that were also trying to rescue. So the jogger's holding them up above the water at the moment. Um, so the the crew they get the the. The person being held up into the boat the jogger manages to recover himself around the stern of the boat but you'll see is that now uh they go straight into there's no signs of life of the person that's come in so they go straight into chest compressions we do chest compressions while we then we get the defib out and set the pads up and then we're anyone that we get in central london we try and take back to our pier um and we do training with london ambulance service they know where the pier is and what facilities we have um so we get quite a good response from them they're usually quite quick coming to us and then we, we'll work alongside them now The, the, the person you can see in the orange overalls, that's a member of the HEMS team. So what they're, they're usually doctors um, that you see in, in helicopters, but they come uh, in cars as well in London because there's not a lot of places where you can land helicopters. Um, so that is um, a bit about uh, what we do, the RLI that saves charities at sea. Um, so I get asked a lot um, about this, or there's probably be a few questions about, about my job and what we do. But one thing I'd like to share with you is that um, obviously we rely on donations. Uh, and, and one of the things that, that really brings home to people what we do is that we quite often, the people that you've seen that we've rescued on these videos, it's very rare that we hear anything else from them. We take them back to the pier, we hand them over to the ambulance service and, and then they go and and uh, generally we don't know what happens to them um, or how they're doing. Uh, but about about six years ago now, um, we had a woman jump off of uh, Lambeth Bridge very late one night. The lifeboat went and rescued her and picked her up. Uh, and it was the same time we took her to the fire pier and she'd met by an ambulance. Uh, and they took her off and we didn't hear anything more until about 15 months later. And we got a thank you card uh, and a letter and it was from a 14 year old girl and an eight year old brother. And, uh, and the letter explained that the, the woman that jumped off Lambeth Bridge was their mum and their, their dad had left and uh, their mum's mental health had deteriorated to the point where she couldn't look after the children anymore and she lost her job and the children got taken into care uh, and it was a downward spiral uh, and it all comes to a head with the suicide attempt that night. But after the rescue, she got the help that she needed uh, and the, the local health authority, they, they got her into part-time work, then become a full-time job. She started living on her own in a flat again, and then eventually the children were returned to her. 
uh, and they could live as a family. And so that letter and card was a thank you from the, the, the girl and her brother, because without her being rescued by the lifeboat that night, um, they would not been uh, they would not have been a family anymore. So they wanted to say thank you for that. And that to me, that makes everything I do worthwhile. And what we do isn't possible without people like you donating to the Arm and the Light to help us save lives at sea and also at the River Thames. So thank you. And thank you, Kevin. And well done indeed for um producing such a fantastically informative um, uh, narrative uh, with the added uh, video, which uh, really does bring it home. And we see you up and down the, the river, obviously, uh, from the Wellington. And uh, we see you're there the whole time. To my mind, and just to speak personally, um, not least because once upon a time I was secretary of a, an inshore shoreline branch in Nottingham back in the 70s. Um, but I'm immensely proud of what you guys do. Um, and I think as a nation, we should be proud as well. Um, there is a reassurance in just knowing you're there, uh, apart from the fact that you're out and the fact that you get so many shouts. I mean, in, a, in the average year when the river's busy, over 600 shouts is an amazing count, two a day in terms of um and i think uh i'm full of admiration for what you guys do in sometimes very difficult circumstances and i think some of those um some of those calls that you, you you put on video there just demonstrate how sensitive it is looking for someone who someone may have spotted under blackfriars bridge and you know and finding him and just think of the value of a life as we know in this covid ridden age not just the value of a life but actually the importance of a life as demonstrated by those kids who wrote to, to you after their mother had jumped, you know, it's families who get affected as well. So there'll never be uh, enough gratitude, I think, for what you chaps do. So thank you. Just one thing I wanted to ask, and we sort of slightly touched on this before. I know back in the 70s, uh, the great move was towards um, self-writing lifeboats. I think that was very much um, initiated way back when the Orkney lifeboat was was lost, um, and that was a long time ago. Uh, and they found her upturned, and in fact, a railway sleeper or something had come back through the wheelhouse and, and hit the coxswain and killed him, um, and the boat turned over. So there was then this great initiative to move. And I remember the Atlantic class, uh, the deep water one was the, the one that came in, which was the first, I think, of the class that was self-writing. Can you give us a sort of resume on where we are in self-writing now, or is that something that's no longer talked about? Um, so all live on the live boats, with the exception of the E-Class, are fitted with self-writing gear. So they build uh, they build all their their boats, they build the, all the, uh, the larger, they're called ALBs, all-weather um, lifeboats. So um, what was the Shannons and Trents, which uh, um, are gradually being replaced they build them in pool and the atlantics they build most of them at cows on the isle of Wight. but before they're sent to stations all of them they've got um they've got facilities in pool to turn the boats over and test the self-writing gear that they fit to that will turn it flip it back over so they're all tested the only boats that haven't got self-writing are the e-class that used at chiswick and at tower mm -hmm. so the original um the original E-class boats, the Mark 1s that we used at the start, they did have self-writing on it. Um, but it added uh, a bit of extra weight and it obviously costs money to uh, test and maintain it. Uh, and then when they was building the, the Mark 2s or was in the planning stage to build the Mark 2s, we looked at the self-writing on the Thames and really, because we don't get the weather that you might get at the coast, where there is a chance of boat capsizing. So Eastbourne lifeboat capsized last week when they was out on a job. Um, and luckily, the crew were all OK. Um, but it was just uh, heavy surf near some rocks where they were trying to rescue somebody. It flipped the boat over. There was an all-weather lifeboat nearby. They recovered the crew. And then the boat was towed back. Uh, I had it self-righted. Um, 
but we don't get weather like that on the Thames in central London. Um, so it was felt that the boat would only overturn because of a collision. Mm. Um, and so it is, I mean, you could never say it's never going to be needed, but the chances of that are, are quite small. And so it was decided that self-writing wasn't going to be fitted to the Mark II and Mark III E-class boats. Mm. So we're the only ones that, that don't have it. Well, I think that's a, a great summary and thank you very much for that indeed. Uh, the other thing I want to say as well is it's only last week that uh, a group of us uh, on, on the Wellington Trust were wondering where the nearest DFIM was. Now we know the answer. We'll yeah. Try not, we'll try not we, use it. Uh, so we've, we've signed up. Um, we've signed up to uh, an app that uh, London Ambulance Service have. So we've got, uh, we've put in the distance either side of the station. And we have actually gone to the Wellington um, because there's somebody's rung an ambulance and said, oh, we've had somebody who's got a suspected heart attack. And so we get an, uh, an automated phone call saying uh, that a defib might be needed at this location. And uh, so the crew have run along the embankment with it. Uh, and thankfully, it, it wasn't needed. But um, if, if you're, you're within our area, so if, if, if anyone puts a 999 call in, yeah. then we will get an alert where, to be honest with you, I, I don't know why they didn't go on the boat. I don't know why they run along the embankment. Boat yeah. does 40 knots, no one's going to yeah. run that fast. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, it's, it's, it's great to know. And thank you so much for doing that shout as well. <laughs> about it. Uh, I think this has been a fantastic talk. I'll mention more in a minute. But uh, I wonder if I can hand over now to Jenny. Jenny, I think you've had some questions. I over certainly do. I certainly do. Um, Kevin, um, question from Malcolm War: Does the RNLI have any role to play in illegal sea migration into the UK? Um, so uh, I can see that it's put to prevent illegal sea migration. So no, the RNLI has no jurisdiction to prevent it. Now, some of the lifeboats at, at Margate um, and Dover and around the coast there, uh, they do launch it. So we're the RNLI and we're a charity that saved lives at sea. It doesn't matter why people are in difficulty, why they're in the water. That's nothing to do with us as an organisation. We are there to rescue people from drowning. So they will launch to people that are in difficulty because a lot of the time we don't know what we're, we're launching to. You just hear that there's somebody in, in trouble, uh, but they're, they're nothing, uh, the, the prevention or otherwise is, is not anything to do with the, the RNLI. We're, uh, we're a completely independent organisation um, and that's our goal is to reduce preventable drownings. Okay. Um, from Chris Dancaster, what is the relationship with the Coast Guard in terms of finding out that someone is in difficulty on the Thames? Um, so if you was to ring 999 and ask for the Coast Guard, or you in London and you ring 999, they will put you through to London Coast Guard. Um, and then we have a hotline that the Coast Guard would bring to us and then we would talk to on the radio. In reality, what the most likely or the most frequent way that we're called is that someone rings 999 and I ask for the police and then the person in the police control room patches it through to the Coast Guard as well to let them know what's happening and they notify us, which slows it down really by sort of 20 seconds or so. It's not, it's not the end of the world. Um, but we work very, very closely with the Coast Guard. Um, so it's the same. So the... Uh, it's, oh, it's, I wouldn't say it's, it's, we're not like the eyes of the Coast Guard, but the, uh, so the Coast Guard has overall coordination of any incident on the Thames, but that might not be, so they'll um, send the most appropriate asset. So um, <coughs> during search and rescue, the police and also the fire boats and maybe the Port of London Authority, they all respond to the Coast Guard as well, should they be there and, and be involved um, in it. But we are the ones, we're the only dedicated search and rescue service. So obviously the police, fire service, PLA, they've all got their own duties to perform, but they can help out should they be in the area. Um, we do self-launch on occasions where we get somebody that rings the station uh, and then it's us notifying the Coast Guard 
but there will never be anything going on without us sharing the information or the Coast Guard sharing the information with us. We don't work, we don't do anything independently from the Coast Guard. Okay. Um, <laughs> somebody says, how can a Flavian D'Souza, hello Flavian, how can a full-time worker manage a 12 hour shift? <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's, it's okay. So we have a, a routine. So um, during the day, on, a, on a, a, a day shift, there's lots of maintenance that needs to be done on the boats and the station. Um, and then um, all that has to be documented as well. And we do training. We do a lot of our training in-house uh, because we have a volunteer with us for 12 hours. Uh, we get a 40 minute unpaid break each day but we can't leave the station during that break in case we're called out um but the, in in normal times there will be um we'll be afloat for an hour or two uh for exercise each day and there's cleaning the boats and cleaning the station and then the night shifts are not quite as regimented um obviously we've got volunteers for us and so we out of our 55 volunteers we've got some students we've got paramedics we've got police officers we've got fire officers we've got somebody who owns his own law firm uh, we've got somebody who works for the environment agency we've got a yeoman warder from the tower of london we've got somebody who works for the bank of england we've got an uh, entrepreneur we've got people that are retired uh, so they come from all walks of life and i've met so many people that i get on quite well with through being working at the lifeboat station that i would never ever ever have met in day-to-day -day life because they're just moving completely different circles to what i do but we, we get on well because we've got this in common. But because we've got, um, so our volunteer this evening, for example, is a builder who's got his own building firm uh, and he's still okay to work during this lockdown. So I know he's been at work today and I know he's got to work tomorrow. So I don't expect him to sit up for 12 hours in case we get a call. Yeah. So we've got some uh, camp beds. So he's brought some bedding in. And so whenever he wants 10 o'clock, so there's some duties to be done around the station for the start of the shift. We'll do some training with him uh, a little bit later, uh, keep his competencies up to date. And then I'll say to him, look, if you want to get your head down for a bit, then you can go in the training room or, or go in one of the other rooms. And then if we get a call, it is, uh, we're, we'll get him, but we don't expect our volunteers to sit up for, yeah. for 12 hours, just in case. And, and a, another question from Flav Flavian, what are the qualifications required for volunteering and what training is given? So uh, the we're very, very fortunate in uh, Tower that I get, uh, it's a little bit different at the moment because of lockdown, but in, in this time two years ago, I would have got about 30 to 35 people a week asking if they could join the lifeboat crew and if we have a waiting list that they could be on. But we can only have 55 volunteers. So we can only recruit new, vol uh, new volunteers when somebody on the crew currently leaves. Uh, and we've got a number of volunteers that have been with us for 15 years or so. We might get four people that leave a year. Um, so, but around the coast, they're not as fortunate because People aren't living in coastal locations anymore. Uh, the fishing industry, which is what crews were traditionally taken from, is, is no more. Um, so the, the RNLA's ethos is that if you're willing to give the time, we will give you the training that you need. So we could have people that have never been on a boat before in their life, but they're willing to dedicate the time to train up to be a crew member. Uh, and we will give them that training. So we do a lot of training in-house. So we have, um, it's a competency-based framework and, uh, and there's an assessment at the end of each unit that people need to pass. And um, we do training in-house, but we also have a training college at our headquarters in Paul where people can go for either day courses or, or residential courses that supplement the training that we do at lifeboat stations um, to get people to a standard, um, I don't want to say where they're, they're helpful, but uh, we can improve improve their skills and knowledge. And um, you, you have kindly, Kevin, offered to come um, uh, by Wellington and give some training to our volunteers before we open for the summer. And yeah. I wanted to say a personal thank you for that. No, that's okay. That's, uh, so that's, so um, I, it's part of what we do is, so the R&I is an institution 
uh, we set ourselves a target um, nearly five years ago now that we was going to try and reduce preventable drowning in the, in the uh, UK and Ireland by 50%. Um, so it, the RNLI has become, uh, whereas uh, most of our history, we've been uh, a reactive organisation. People are in trouble, we go and rescue them. In the last few years, we've tried to be a bit more proactive and so doing things like that, of, um, of, of going out into the community and, and sharing some of the knowledge that we've got about what people can do if they see somebody in difficulty or uh, how to respond, how they can help us on a, on a job, all these sorts of things, um, or doing some water safety. Uh, and, and hopefully we can try and prevent some people getting in, in trouble in the first place. So, that's, uh, so it's part of what we do. Thank you, and I will be there. <laughs> Um, where, where is the tower pier being relocated to? Is it staying? Uh, no, we're in the same. So we're in the same location. So it, what it would be is that when the time's right, they will uh, tow this one away. We'll be in a. Um, so they build the new station off site. Um, they will then tow this one away. We'll be in a temporary station for a time period that's not been determined yet. While they put the new one in place, and then we move on to the new new station. But. We, uh, so the original, originally we was put at Tower Pier because that was the, the best available location. Where we are now, we couldn't be in a better place for, for um, the, so about 70% of our work is between Lambeth Bridge and Tower Bridge. And we are right in the middle of that area. So um, we're not giving up our location. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna make this the last question um let me oh gosh we've got lots of them i will send them to you afterwards <laughs> um do you cover beyond the thames barrier and if so can you get uh, through to an, an an incident when the barrier is raised so uh i i yeah we can we do go through the barrier so we we go about another mile and a half or so uh barking creek um, that's about as far down as we go, sort of halfway reach, uh, maybe. If the barrier's shut, then no, we can't go through. And then Grace End Lifeboat have to come up a little bit further. Um, but, but yeah. My last oh, can I answer this one uh, from Richard Clark? What okay. is the life expectancy should you fall in the Thames? Because that's maybe <laughs> something that I should have mentioned. So the Thames, because it's a fast flowing river, it's cold all year round. Um, and uh, the 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 life expectancy in the river is not as much as what you would think it'd be so salt water is naturally more buoyant than fresh water so the the river thames on the big spring tides is brackish up until about blackfriars but for all intents and purposes it's a freshwater river through central london um so as a really really rough rule of thumb um as a rough guide and obviously it's different for depending on people's circumstances, but we take it as a, whatever the air temperature is outside, you, that's how many minutes you'll survive in the Thames for. So at the moment where it's one, two degrees, yeah. you're looking at one or two minutes before you are in very serious trouble. Um, there's a, 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 a thing that you get cold water shot, which is in the summer, we get people that jump off bridges, showing off in front of their mates or filming it for YouTube to put on the internet as a prank uh, and they they hit the water and it's so much colder than you'd expect and so your initial reaction is to go <gasps> and gasp but of course you're going into the water so you breathe cold water in yeah. which then makes your core cold straight away and then you really really struggle um so if anyone finds themselves in the thames unexpectedly what we advise people is that you do not try to swim because you're not going to swim against the tide and you're most likely going to be gasping. So we tell people to float on their back and starfish. And uh, it's not just us, it's a thing that they, they are and I advise people around the coast. If you find yourself in water unexpectedly, is to float on your back, starfish, it's float to live, and that will control your breathing. Um, and then once you're on your back and you've acclimatized the water a little bit, you can then maybe start looking, you can either wait until to be rescued 
Uh, and we have saved people on the Thames that have done this, that have just been floating on their back and we've picked them up and they've seen it on a cinema, uh, an advert on a cinema or in a magazine or on Facebook uh, and they remembered it and that has saved their life. So float to live. That's a very good tip. Thank you so much indeed. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, um, may I just say that the Wellington Trust will be making a donation to RNLI from its own coffers because yeah. we, we thank you very much indeed for, for uh, taking the time in what's obviously a very busy schedule. And I expect you need something. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but we'll, we'll make sure you get it. I hope, thank it's you. Been a, I hope it's been a quiet evening for you, Kevin, apart from uh, what you've been doing, which is incredibly informative, as I said earlier on, and I'm very grateful to add to Jenny's thanks on that, for what you've done. Just one question I would pick up and that was Henry Fullerton says is it possible to visit the tower station when we're visiting London I hope the answer is yes is that the case or does it interfere with um, duties so it, it it depends when you come so at the moment we we can't take any visitors at all so we we've uh it, it's only uh enrolled crew that are on shift that come on station because of coronavirus restrictions so in in normal times because uh we're a working lifeboat station um we don't really have a visitors area as such we we have a visits team where we have planned visits for groups to come along um and, and they take bookings but what we do is uh, a few weekends usually around the totally thames festival time yeah. is that because we have people that are just families or like smaller groups that um, we, we do a few weekends where we put a, a, a booking up on the Totally Thames website where if it's just one, two, three, four, not a group of 20, you can book time slots. And so we, we put them out where so people that are coming into London might be able to uh, do it at the same time and come and visit the lifeboat station. Yeah. Um, when the new station comes in, which I know we're talking a, a couple of years back, that uh, project, despite the, the world at the moment, is still on track to be completed when it's scheduled to be. We're not falling behind because of coronavirus. Uh, but the, the new station will have a dedicated visitor's experience on it because uh, at the moment, we're making the best use of the space that we've got as an operational station. Yeah. Because now we can, we've not taken over appear we're building our own one and and uh, having what we want on it we're going to try we've got to try and make the best of our location that we've got um so we will be open more to visitors in the future than what we are at the moment i think uh, that's that's uh, a good way to finish um and uh, thank you very much for that information and once again to say you're going to be most welcome on board when we're open up again whenever that may be uh, make sure it's one of your four days when you're off, maybe. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you very much indeed. Now, uh, we get to the point, and things are slightly different this month than they have been in previous months, where, as I said earlier on, um, if you would like to come in and turn on your videos and turn on your microphones, uh, do have a chat. Uh, Kevin, if you're allowed to, stay on if you wish uh, and join. This is uh, always an enjoyable part of the evening, um, even though we can't uh, clink glasses too much um, over the net. But uh, if you're doing, if you would like to stay on, uh, do hang around. And I know that Matt uh, Edgar in the background is going to come and click you uh, alongside, which will enable you to be able to turn on your audio and your video. And with that, we come to the end of the formal part of the evening. And thank you all for attending. Oh, okay. <laughs> Here we go. Kevin, ask Kevin. There we are. First in, John and Barbara. <laughs> there, John and Barbara. Terrific. Uh, good evening. Oh. Hello. Can you hear us? Have I got it all wrong? <laughs> yeah, no, it's always working this time. It's brilliant. We're actually um, Bexley Heath Branch Life uh, Rough Fundraising. Oh, that's good. Life. For the last 30 years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah. We, I was wondering whether it is possible at some point whether we could just bring a few people up to look round, but maybe we should wait until you get your new. Um, yeah. Oh well. I, I mean, who knows with the way that things are at the moment how it's going to go? But 
but um, I, I, yeah, you're 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 welcome. It's um, I'm trying to think of the best way uh, to put you in contact. Uh, but then, uh, obviously, they, they've got um, so Jenny and and Alistair will be able to get it. They've got yeah. my my email and, and contact because we've yeah, been emailing and setting this up. So uh, when 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 the world's opening up again, if you want to email me and um, and then we'll see what we can arrange then. That'd be great. It's good that for us be. if we could combine it with a visit to the Wellington as well. And <laughs> yeah. Maybe bring a few people along there for afternoon tea. <laughs> that was a good idea. I, I'll take on, Fiona and I will take on the job of coordinating that possibility. Now, Jenny, if I may come across to you, I realise I've done a boo-boo because I haven't let you talk about our next lecture. Would you like to give us a quick word on it now? Just a quick word. There will be an invite coming through, as, as you all know. Um, 8th of March, Treasures of the National Maritime Museum by Simon Stevens, the curator. So you'll be hearing from us next week with that. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Good evening, Jim. Good to see you. I hope you're keeping well down there. As well as we can, the uh, oh, there we are. This white blanket outside that uh, encourages us to have a cold drink inside. <laughs> uh, have you have you got the eight inches we got up here in Suffolk? Uh, no, no, no. We're very light down here. Oh, only, you are. only two inches. Well, <laughs> it was lovely. There was a guy on the other day from Suffolk. He was talking about the dig, the new film that a lot of people were talking about about the Sutton Who on Netflix, quick ad, quick advert, the Sutton Who uh, ship up in, yep, yep. Uh, in Suffolk. And he was talking about, and he was talking about training um, um, uh, Ralph Fiennes in the lead part in, uh, with the dialect. And he said, and his name was uh, Charlie, um, uh, Charlie Haylock, that's his name. And he said, well, first thing I did is I got the script and I got, uh, and I got the script suffocating. And then I could start again uh, with a Suffolk. So there it was, but that was right. But we are being suffocated by snow at the moment. Mm. It is really quite exciting. It's not quite rushing yet, but we're getting there. <laughs> well, now the um, the interesting thing down here is that uh, just outside of Tunbridge Wells, the uh, the rain of late has caused three mm. landslips, and you know this would have happened at any time. No. Uh, nothing to do with um, no. lockdown. But uh, if it wasn't locked down, it would be a disaster because the uh, the rail line is blocked from here to London for three weeks. Oh, good my heavens God. above! But good heavens above! Three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah, um, it's between Tunbridge Wells and Tunbridge. Good heavens above! That's so what happened it, down commuter time. You know, it would be an absolute disaster. There was that place down in Devon a few years back that, uh, do you remember, that uh, lost its railway? Mm. Uh, it fell into the sea as well. I yeah. mean, oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the only way getting back in fast. Uh, Richard, good evening to you. Richard Shuttleworth, good to see you. That was a good point, actually, you raised uh, about um, flotation. Um, what do you actually wear, Kevin? Uh, are you able to get into the water yourself if necessary? Um, so we used to. We used to wear dry suits all the time, uh, but then we looked at after the Thames stations as a whole are, are done, uh, or say not Thames stations, Chiswick and Tower, so E class stations had done around 10,000 jobs. We looked at how often people have actually got in the water, and it wasn't very often. And so we're looking at the cost of keep buying dry suits for everyone and the maintenance of them. Um, and it was actually me that made the decision that it wasn't. It wasn't cost effective. So we now wear the kit, that the, the Heli Hansen kit that the ALB crews wear. So the yellows, the leggings, wellies and, and, um, and jackets. That's what yeah. we wear on the boat. But we carry dry, a, a dry suit. So at the start of the shift, we have a designated person that should we have to put somebody in the water, it's going to be you. And then we size them up with a dry suit and we carry that on the boat because there's not been... It's only been once, maybe twice, in all the years that we've been operating that someone's had to jump in, like instantly. Um, so there's other times they would have time to get changed and put a dry suit on. Um, yeah. Should but it's it's very rare that we have to put somebody in the water. 
this this business about uh, survival time in the water that uh, Richard raised, Richard Clark, um, who, by the way, did I think come and uh, he was on one of the parties that came to your station a couple of years ago, I remember, um, to see see what goes on. Um, this, this business about life, it must be uh, terribly difficult. You've got 15 minutes to get to a, to, to, a, to, a, to a shout or to get to that that point where you need to be against that life expectancy. I didn't realize it was anything mm. as cute as that. Yeah, I, so I, I mean, so most of our, most of what we do is, is we've been, so I, we humanly, most of our jobs are within maybe four, about four and a half minutes to us arriving on scene is the, the sort of average because we do have 15 minutes, but once or twice a year, we might go all the way down to Barking, maybe a bit more than that. Yeah. But yeah. the majority would be sort of London Bridge, Tower Bridge, Waterloo right outside the station, Westminster, and they're all a lot closer. Um, so that's where I was talking about our location being perfect because we are right in the centre yeah. of, um, of... So when the more often if we go to the extremities especially eastwards because once you get under tower bridge it's just the, the embankment walls it's more for sort of boats breaking down and people ill injured on on boats either um commercial craft or passenger party boats uh it's, it's not not as often the people in the water uh that that far down but obviously yeah you're always mindful of the fact that it is a bit of a race to get there um, yeah Absolutely. Um, yeah. one, of the, one of the questions, and it was Captain Stephen Taylor, our past chairman, who, um, or one of our past chairmen, who raised the point about the fire brigades and how you work in conjunction with the fire brigade. Stephen was making the point that maybe you're quite similar in your, in your task once you get there. I've got John up and not anybody else. Uh, Stephen, do you want to? Are you, are you on? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Just wondered, Kevin, with um, there, there was something I saw the other day about the fire brigade. They were doing a bit of a commercial, and I thought, hang on, that's exactly what the RNLI do. Um, I mean, obviously it's coordinated, but is there any um, sort of sense of um, first come, first served, or, or the charge, <laughs> well, charge of, of a coordination if, if one is needed? Um, so that. Uh, sits with the Coast Guard as to what vessel to launch. Um, but they, they, more often than not, it, it's, it's, we'll, we'll be, well, we can both be launched to the same jobs um, and more often than not, we'll be there the, uh, first yeah. because we've got a much faster boat. Uh, and we're also set up to, um, to, to launch quicker. So the, the, the fireboat on the Thames is actually there that if there's a fire on the riverside is they'll pump water to the, the fire crews. That's that originally what they was put on the Thames for, but they've taken, um, because it's not just fire brigade now, they're fire and rescue service. Um, yeah. But then there's quite often there, there'll be jobs where we'll arrive on the scene and we'll assess the situation and we'll wait for the fire boat or we'll call the fire boat and say, look, you're better suited to this, can you come? Because they've got a, a larger deck and a larger platform. So if it's something that it's not as critical that we evacuate somebody straight away, it might be better that they get there um, and they can they can put their boat on the ground and they have a flap that they lower down as a sort of a bridge, whereas you saw on ours that you have to walk out into the water a little bit and pass someone over the high bow. Um, the fire boat are, are more set up and the other thing they've got is if it's mud rescue, they've got the mud rescue mats and all that sort of gear. So we yeah. work we work together uh, for the most most appropriate for the situation. Um, I don't know what advert or where you see it's a bit of an advertisement, whether it's on the Thames, but what the Fire Brigade uh, London Fire Service have got at the moment is they've rolled out a lot of sort of uh, inflatable boats that um, they can put. So it's, it's more for inland waterways that uh, either in the docks or some of the lakes in the ponds and, uh, and they can, uh, they have a response truck that can turn up and they can put a boat in the water with sort of 25, 30 minutes by the time that they get there. They set it up, they inflate it, they do their checks, they put a little outboard on it and, and then they're off. But they're not strong enough for the, the, the Thames, the, 
they, they can't go against the tide. So they're never going to launch them in the river, but they do launch them. They might do, for example, at Hampton Court beyond Tennington, where it's not, not tidal. Um, oh, interesting. But yeah, we have a good relationship with the fire service. Good. Tell me, um, Kevin, do you still wear the Typhoon immersion suits? Uh, no. Um, so the East, uh, the the suppliers for the Arm and Lion now is Heli Hansen. So it used to be Typhoon and Musto, uh, and no. now it's solely Heli Hansen. Uh, so we I, have Heli Hansen gear. I designed the Typhoon one 25 years ago. <laughs> okay, well, between me and you, I much prefer the, the Typhoon one to the uh, to Heli Hansen, but uh, that, that's what they've given us. And um, no, yeah, they're, they're good suits. So the, we on the um, so uh, on the on the Thames in Central London, so Gravesend, because it's the, the B class, they still wear the uh, the non-breathable, but we used to wear a, a breathable version. Uh, that's what we carry on the Thames. So they're good for about ten or fifteen minutes or so, um, and because obviously we've not got the weather that I spoke about earlier, the the crews aren't constantly getting wet. But so um, that's what we wore. Now, Kevin, if you're happy to roll on. There have been a couple of more questions. I think Chris Dankster, you had your hand up, I think. Is that yes, right? I, it, was, it was just one point about the, uh, the headquarters in Poole. We, uh, was as association, we had our AGM and uh, at the, um, the headquarters of Poole. And that, uh, that establishment there is quite amazing. An enormous, great uh, swimming pool, but not a swimming pool, uh, indoor, indoor um, I don't know quite what you'd call it, but it's enormous and they can float all the boats in the, That's right. in, in, the in the pool there. And if anybody were to get the chance to uh, to, to get down there, I don't know whether it's open to the public or whether it's uh, we've got a privileged access, but it was an absolutely fascinating weekend. Um, wow. So in, in normal times um, is that they have a, a visit today, so it's free of charge. Um, and so it's if you're thinking, oh, I might go to the pool on... That day, that weekend, or whatever, you can go online, and they and they're booking. And obviously, sometimes it's full, and you can't get on it. But they they do tours throughout the day, and as you say, that's um, so that's where absolutely we do the, amazing. Place. Yeah, the, yes. the the pool that you say that's where we do the sea survival training. That's also where they capsize the lifeboats to test them in that, and they have. Um, so it's a bit more than just a wave machine, but they also simulate weather. So you can have thunder and lightning and rainstorms and heavy and high winds that go through the pool. And that's where I was saying that we um, supplement the training with uh, residential courses. So uh, there's also a, a hotel at the Lifeboat College. So there's a training centre and, and they, they rent the rooms for extra income. They rent the rooms out that aren't being taken on by, by crews that are training at the college. Well, but, we, uh, we, we stayed actually in, 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 the, in the college. Yeah, the, I, fantastic value. Yeah, splendid. Yeah. Even though the food wasn't bad either. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Robin, Robin Bat, you had something to ask, I think, you? No, it was mainly a comment for both you and Jenny Mosley. Oh, yeah. Uh, there, is, there is a defibrillator on board now. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, and all the staff have been... Uh, advanced first aid training. The other thing is that when, I don't know whether it was you, Kevin, but three years ago, we had a training session on board the Wellington and the crew from your station came down and we had bodies floating in the water and life belts being flung in the water. Was that, were you yeah, there then? Yeah, that was me. Uh, I, I arranged that with, I can't remember her name now. But, um, uh, well, it was probably either uh, Alison or Harris or it was uh, Alison. Guy. Yeah. It was Alison. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, and we, we come down and we, and we did some out on the deck and then we went down to the platform uh, yeah. and it was exactly what I've been talking to Jenny about, about what to do if you see somebody in difficulty, how to raise the alarm, what you can do to help us. Don't go in the water yourself. <laughs> no, I remember all that. The other thing was that for Alistair and Jenny's benefit, the, the procedures on board now are that we don't phone the police or the ambulance, we phone the Coast Guard and we ask immediate response from tower station because they can be with us in eight minutes i think i'm right kevin uh from if, if we got called to the wellington now from here we, we'd be there in less than three 
Okay, uh, well, we were told eight minutes yeah. was the maximum. That's, that's uh, fantastic. That, that was our first point of call, not not the yeah. police or anybody else. It was the obviously we we're not we're not always here. So that's where I was saying about the, the Coast Guard being the overall coordinator, yeah. because if you was to ring the lifeboat station, we might not be here. Or if you used to speak to someone in the lifeboat, we could be all the way down at Greenwich. But the fire boat might be over a, a festival, which is only going to take them two or three minutes. So the Coast Guard knows where all the vessels are, so they can send the most appropriate asset first. Yeah. But, but our, our remit is to phone the Coast Guard, not, not any yeah. short line yeah. people, first of all. If the, Kevin, if the Garden Bridge had happened, was that uh, something you put into your risk register as what it was going to do for your shout level? Is, is what, sorry? The Garden Bridge, if that had happened. Oh, um, it's a difficult one, that, because um, I, no one really knew. So it was, when, in their planning, it was taken into consideration uh, that it could be some, somewhere where people would sit and contemplate their, their future. Um, but they, it was, the, the, the people that was going to be in charge of it, their plan was to have training for security staff to try and spot uh, people that was potentially contemplating um, any self-harm yeah. and, and to be able to approach them in the right way. Um, I think it would not have been a frequent occurrence just because of the 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 bridges that we go to most often are Westminster, London Bridge, uh, and Waterloo Bridge. Yeah. And I think the, the reason Westminster is iconic, Waterloo Bridge is right by uh, West, uh, Waterloo Station and all the bus routes, and London Bridge is the same. We don't go to Tower Bridge very often because London Bridge is closer to anybody that is getting public transport into London. Sure. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Mm. Millennium yeah. Footbridge is not one that we, we go to frequently, and I think maybe for the same reasons. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Wow. We could go on all night, I think, and maybe some of us will. But um, I'm here till seven. <laughs> you are. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah. Now, Richard, Richard, Richard Clark. Bye, James. Good to see you. Richard, you had um you had an experience with the RNLI, I think, didn't you? Down on a certain um sailing race. <laughs> The fast net, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kevin, thank you very much. I've never actually used your station in anger, but I'm clocking them up slowly. We've done Plymouth, we've done Bosom, uh, sorry, Brixham, uh, where we had a full halo, which was quite exciting. Uh, our skipper lost his finger. Um, oh, okay. Also, the one in the Isle of Wight for training, which I'd done that before I did uh, Brixham, which was rather good. But very, very interesting, yes. We had to stop a race because someone had a cup of water, a cup of hot uh, tea was spilt over them. Oh, that. Yeah. No gimbals. <laughs> no gimbals. No. No. Yeah, well, that's really good. Very interesting talk. And um, the other question I was going to ask is at its maximum speed, what does the river flow at? Uh, so it's. It depends. So at Blackfriars, for example, where you've got the two bridges very close together and the remains of the old St Paul's Railway Bridge, uh, on a really big spring tide, it can get up to sort of about six, six and a half knots going through there. So wow. the, the River Thames in London at Westminster, in its natural state, should be about a mile and a half wide. So Parliament is built where it was because it was on marshland within the, or on solid ground within the marshlands of the Thames. So it was easily defendable. But uh, over the years, it's been a banked upon, a banked upon, a banked upon. Um, so it's a lot narrower than what it should be, which is why it's so fast flowing. So uh, in the, on, the, on the big spring, the tide at Westminster, uh, it could be a 7.7 .7 metre rise, and that's in just over five hours. And that's some indication of, of how fast it, it comes in. Amazing. Um, Richard Shuttleworth, uh, yes. hey, did you, when you were flying the air ambulance from Royal London, did you have interaction with the RNLI from time to time? Was it quite common or not? Not very common because we were quite close to, the hospital was quite close, so to get a helicopter out 
it's almost quicker to get a fast response car or an ambulance. But um, I was around when the Marchioness went down, and of course we couldn't do anything about that. And uh, when the station started, they did ask us if we had a winching capability. But um, some of us ex-Navy pilots could do that, but the chaps in the back could not. And now they're all ex-civilian pilots and they have no experience of winching. And I think, when a, as Kevin will probably tell you, when somebody falls in the river, unless you get them pretty quickly, they go down and come up about a week later. Yeah, yeah we... Um... So we've had uh, a Coast Guard, in, so we've done training exercise, but we've had in anger a uh, Coast Guard helicopter that just happened to be um, close to yeah. London that uh, they winched somebody down, they winched the medic down into the lifeboat to help with resuscitation of somebody that was, uh, but that they was pulled out of the water right down near Barking where it's a lot wider and not with so many things around. Um, I've seen the air ambulance as well land on the foreshore um, by just the other side of Tower Bridge. Absolutely amazing. And I, 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 I it had to be like about th maybe not even three metres clearance between the river wall and the rotor blades. Like it was so, so impressive that the skill of the helicopter to land in that, uh, nearest, in that space. The nearest one to you is Middle Temple Hall, but it's full of lawyers and they don't really like it. <laughs> yeah, so we've we've had one as well then in the in the park over the over the street. But as you say, in yeah. London, more often than not, they come in the they come in the cars, fast response vehicles, and then they'll they'll go in the ambulance with them. Yes. Will the will the new um, um, uh, extension, the TTT extension down at Blackfriars, will that provide a, a forward sort of a landing platform? I don't know the answer to that. Do you know the answer to that, Richard? I don't know. Do you know if it's going to be... Sorry, whereabouts is that? Well, the one just down by Blackfriars, where they're building out into the river as part of the new uh, Thames Tideway Tunnel. And there's a oh, right. Isn't that just temporary? I, I mean, it's... Oh, the... It's going to be a public open space. This one will be written. Yeah. He was talking, actually. If you use it regularly, you have to be approved as an official helipad. All oh, right. Sure do that. Yeah. Very yeah. complicated. There we are. I mean, we're quite fortunate where we are that we've got St. Thomas is just over the river. The Royal London's not too far. It's only at Whitechapel. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, if there's issues of getting there, you've got King's College Hospital over in Camberwell. So we're, we're quite well served. Yeah. I mean, in Chelsea and Westminster's not too far. Yeah. Um, so we're, 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 we're quite well served by hospitals within the central London area. For us, yeah. I mean, we have a good, uh, quite a good response from London Ambulance Service normally. Yeah. Can I ask a question, please? Yes, Richard Bridges. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Th th this is just an aside, uh, asking or talking about people who don't say thank you. I was flying in endurance flights in an ancient area of the Thames when my observer saw a pointed thing which looked like a boy, but wasn't a boy, and there was someone sitting on top of it. There was a motorboat which had gone out for the day They'd run over their anchor cable, they'd pull the propeller out of the boat, and she was upside down, or she's going to fly in the air. The girl in the water was pregnant and clearly in a poor way. She couldn't get on the boat. We winched her out, took her to Leon Solent, were told, and we got actually to the hospital. We probably had about four or five minutes um, before losing the baby and everything else. And very lucky you were there, but you never heard a word back. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's um, so off on the way. I remember back uh, in my Minesweeper days, there was a call. We'd just come out of, we just come out of Torquay. It was a really, really bad blowing night. And uh, the uh, Brixham Coast, Coast Guards came on and said two, two red flares down south of Start Point. Uh, so we started heading down towards Star Point southwards, and um, uh, eventually we were called off, um, and that was some time after we had seen uh, it was bad sea return on the radar, so we couldn't see it, but we saw what looked like two vessels lying ahead, and it turned out to be a, a fishing boat towing a yacht. Uh, the yacht had, I think, been borrowed uh, by two blokes who decided they were going to try and make it down to Washington. They hadn't listened to their weather forecast, just set off. They were towed back into Brixham. Meanwhile, there was a search continuing. And I remember 
that uh, it involved um, Caldrose, it involved um, other naval units, involved merchant ships. I think there was something in excess of 30 units looking for whoever had filed two red flares before they were called off. Never a word of thanks back to anybody. No, and it doesn't get any better. Driving yeah. Jupiter, I was going down in thick fog towards Cadiz through the Bay of Biscuits, and, and we had a, a distress call, an SOS, which we answered. The only thing, the only clue we had was the SOS painter and painter as we closed it. The chap was convinced he was in a particular location. That's what he sat to have said. And we had three lifeboats out, and four merchant ships diverted looking for him. And eventually we found him more or less where, we, where we'd started from, the Swedish coast, I found him. Yeah. So we paid off everyone else sent off a team to look after him. A big catamaran, mental jammed up the mast. A, his engine was now to the half full of sand. And he took it all as job, thanks very much. And um, no thanks, no no um, um, glad handing for the first or Um Part of the job. That's why I would have everyone who goes to sea as a civvy having a license. Absolutely what I said at that time. It should be all licensed. Yeah, absolutely. Hey ho. Hey, well, look, thank Kevin, you very much. I think it's time for some downtime for you. You've done brilliantly well. You've done two for the price of one. We got Bog Off RNLI, which is fantastic. Buy one, get one free. Fantastic. <laughs> and thank, thank you. you so much again for coming on. And uh, great to see everybody else has stayed on as well. So.